Thank you all very much for sharing with us your vision. We hope to be more present, achieve, and succeed through all the short sprints in our life. We shall now move on with the event. Conversations entice every human imagination. With that, I would take great pleasure in inviting Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma, Indian astronaut, and Dr. S. Ramakrishnan, former director, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, on stage for their conversations today. Would be on, the, on 2022, India's interstellar tryst with space. Joining with them in conversation would be Mr. Sriram Viji, IIT Madras, class of 2000. We request the dignitaries to please step on stage. Thank you. It's uh, indeed an incredible honor to be moderating this session. Uh, very welcome to all of you ladies and gentlemen, but especially to our esteemed guests here today, uh, Dr. S. Ramakrishnan as mentioned, was the former director of the VSSE. For those of you who are not too familiar, VSSE is where India develops and um, creates our rocket engines. So indeed, uh, Dr. S. Ramakrishnan has headed rocket science in India for many years. And when we talk about power, you can't get much more power than a rocket engine. So thank you, sir, for joining us today. And Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma probably needs little introduction to many of you. He has been the first and only Indian national in space. Uh, we will talk more about the experiences of these two gentlemen and get a perspective from them about where India is going with its space program and how we are going to contribute to the future of this fantastic area. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a brief introduction about India and space, um, I will start with, you know, we have made the statement by 2022 that we will get an Indian back in space in an Indian launch vehicle. Now, this is an ambition set forth by the government. It's a huge ambition. There are only three countries in the world that are capable and have done this. This is uh, the former Soviet Union or Russia, uh, the USA and China. And we have made a commitment from our country, from our government, that we will accomplish the same. As you know, ISRO is the uh, apex institution for space research in India, formed in 1969. We have had many achievements. Indian space program has had many achievements in the past. We have started with the Aryabhata satellite uh, launched uh, on a Soviet space shuttle. We have had the Rohini satellite, which was launched on the SLV-3, which Dr. S. Ramakrishnan himself contributed to, which was the first Indian satellite on an Indian launch vehicle. But more impressively, we have got so much more mention in the past years. The PSLV, as we call it, which launches very often from the Satish Dhawan Space Center, Sri Harikota, as many of you know, we had 44 launches in the last years, and it has had an amazing success rate. The first one was a failure, and past that, we have had exactly one failure out of 44 launches, one of the most successful uh, and cost-effective satellite launch vehicles in the world. So given... So given this kind of a track record and, you know, the pride we have in our space program, I think this is a fantastic conversation to have about what it lies in the future as well. So just to kick off the conversation, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, I might start with you. You know, I've mentioned a few highlights, but from your perspective, you know, what are some of the greatest achievements and why do you think the Indian space program is where it is today? Um, now, as you rightly put it, uh, uh, basically there are when we started, in fact, the people, the countries which had access to space, that means autonomy in accessing space, that is putting an object into space, the capability, were hardly five or so, if I'm not wrong, five, when we were supposed to be the sixth country who could uh, launch a satellite from our own soil with SLV-3. You know, accessing space is a difficult technology, and the launch vehicle technology, that's why it's called rocket science. It is a multidisciplinary uh, engineering, complex engineering uh, task, uh, or which we could uh, embark on it and then master it. And uh, with, while well, SLV-3 was, just gave us uh, the confidence that we can do it in way back in 1980, 
What happened sub subsequently is something heartening. We got into operational launch vehicle development, the PSLV, and which has been a very great success. The very first vehicle, operational vehicle, which we tried, uh, jumping from something like PSLV-3, a 22-ton liftoff weight with a 40 kg satellite into low Earth orbit capability, we jumped to a 300-ton launcher, which can put about 1 to 1.5 tons into polar orbit, which was meant for taking care of our remote sensing satellites, which has been a great success today. As you know, PSLV has established itself as one of the very, very reliable launcher in the world, and it has attracted a lot of global attention also. And then there has been no looking back. We have got into the operational launch phase with the GSLV. And then today we have also the, the bigger vehicle, Mar 3, which is going to enhance our capability. And with, with this, though, we started with meeting the immediate needs of uh, uh, the, what was uh, exposed by Sarabai as how to harness this space technology for the development of the country. Having accomplished the basic objectives, we also have embarked on planetary missions like Chandrayaan and the Mars mission. And today we have the capability to confidently embark on any kind of space missions. And of course, now we know the government has also given its nod for us to take up the challenge of putting man into space. And it's really a, a great moment of pride for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll pass over the next question to Sir Rakesh Sharma. So, as the only Indian to have gone to space, it would be great to understand what is the training required? What are the emotions you feel? What does it take to get a person into space? Well, <clears throat> before I answer that, I think uh, I would like to acquaint the audience with the uh, challenges which are present and really the training goes to ensure that you're able to meet those challenges uh, without much of a problem. And the biggest difference is the lack of gravity uh, in, uh, in near Earth orbit, which is where I've been. And um, the lack of gravity causes physiological changes to occur within the body. And therefore, uh, and uh, unfortunately, you cannot replicate zero gravity on Earth for um, a period longer than about 25 seconds. So uh, you can probably do a particular maneuver, which is what we did in this transport aeroplane which we were taken up in. And when it performs that parabolic uh, push over, uh, for about 25 seconds, conditions of zero gravity exist. Now that's not enough for uh, physiological changes to start happening. The length of time is not enough. So you just get a sense of the difficulty of operating in that environment. Uh, everything else is flying around. Uh, you, even if you're going to do a small task, you need to anchor yourself. The laws of physics change. When you apply a force, you start going in the opposite direction if you don't anchor yourself before you apply that force. So, uh, so these are problems which uh, you are acquainted with um, academically, you're told about them, but you get to experience them only during the actual space flight. So most of the training uh, was to condition the human body to prepare it to uh, operate in that environment to facilitate the adaptation of the human body to zero gravity. And then to learn while you're at it during training what are the systems which you will be operating? And in our case, apart from the systems which were present in the spacecraft, we needed to learn the experiments, how to perform them, because uh, there were scientific experiments which uh, were required to be performed using the zero gravity environment for our scientists. So uh, that's what the training was all about. And from a personal standpoint, after you do all this, when you do reach up into space and you do um, experience space flight, you're left with the feeling that, you know, 
it's, it was just another day at the office. That's how good the training was. And you start wondering, why do we need to train for one and a half years? Because things really are not as difficult as they were made out to be or as you yourself assumed before uh, you actually went up in space. So you are quite averse to risk or, I mean, are quite used to risk being a test pilot. So when you went up in the spacecraft, was it just another day in the office? Yeah, so um, as I was saying, uh, there were no surprises. Um, in, in other words, uh, the procedures were so well taped up due to the hours and hours of simulator work that uh, you were pretty well prepared. So uh, if you're not surprised during a particular flight, it does tend to be another day at the office. <laughs> So that brings up an important question. Most satellite launches, most launches are unmanned. So this is a question to both of you. You know, we've had Sputnik go up, then we had Laika, we had Mr. Yuri Gagarin, Neil Armstrong, all these statements about putting a man on the moon, now putting a man on Mars. Um, why, why do we send people to space? Why not just machines? Why do we send people to space? Uh, the thing is that as we were discussing, in fact, uh, this morning, uh, you can hear uh, and read newspaper reports that uh, the Cassini or the Voyager has uh, gone zillions of kilometers away and has sent back high resolution pictures. But you know, that's about it. It's, it satisfies your curiosity. But when a human is part of the story, you want to know what's going on, you identify with that human, and that human is able to convey to you the experience uh, of that uh, particular uh, mission and, and how it felt. Now, these are stories which you would not uh, otherwise have been told by any unmanned uh, mission. So therein lies the difference and of course the fact that uh, humans uh, hardwired uh, into their systems is exploration. And that is why you will always find that humans have been pushing the boundaries of science all this while. So it's like a mountain which is there, and if it is there, it has to be climbed. Of course, uh, I, as uh, Rakesh put it, the, the psychological and emotional impact of human being going to space and then narrating the experience and how the you connect with that, it's definitely several orders higher than what you receive through robotic exploration. But notwithstanding that, we all know that there is always anything is possible with uh, robotic exploration, artificial intelligence, all those things, but then nothing can totally replace the, the flexibility, dexterity, the, the versatility of a human being. So when you talk about exploration, definitely human beings, uh, a trained human being, can accomplish quite a lot and several of you would have read, uh, which I also did some, that what Curiosity has accomplished on, on Mars over several years could have been accomplished over a period of a week or month by a trained geologist because you can take on the spot decisions and you can gather much more information. Not only that, that is with reference to the exploration, but when you talk about the current uh, activities going on in space or what is envisaged to happen in the near future in terms of space resources utilization like asteroid mining and also talking about uh, um, harnessing resources from moon. Um, you know, though one can start with a sort of robotic initial maneuvers and initial activities, eventually human beings are required even to supervise these robots. In fact, when we talk about yeah, lunar um, habitat. The lunar habitat can be built with uh, robotic in implements, but then that has to be supervised and controlled by human beings. So people talk about cis lunar orbit, where the astronauts will be orbiting the moon, and from there they will be controlling. Because first of all, for uh, for an astronaut to go down and land on the moon and stay there, you need the habitat first. So the plan is to build habitats using. Uh, 3D printing kind of technology and robotic uh, uh, implements and then they have to be tended by astronauts and controlling these robots from ground 
for such complex jobs is not going to be easy. Even now, when we talk about Mars exploration through rovers, uh, what is happening, you know, the kind of uh, advanced planning required, the kind of uh, activities which you have to plan, and then the progress made, daily progress is much limited. Uh, and it, 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 has, it can be enhanced several uh, orders when actually the human presence is there. So both exploration and also um, the foreseen economic activity and harnessing of space resources, if it has to become reality, human beings' presence and their involvement in space operations becomes a necessity. So, sir, just to follow on on that, when we talk about the aspiration of 2022, putting an Indian on space and eventually maybe on the moon or Mars or as it may come, what are the pieces of the puzzle that are still missing? for us? As I said, uh, the first thing uh, which, uh, when, before we start, talk about putting uh, human being into space, first is the ability for us to access space. That is our ability to put some object into space, the spacecraft or the capsule, whatever it is. That we have accomplished and we have a very good handle on that. Now when you want to do this, and when you want, that's a launch vehicle is essentially the implement to do that. Now when you want to spend, uh, send an astronaut into space, you know, that is you are putting a human being and committing him on this craft, the launch vehicle, and safely take him to space, the stakes are very high and one has to look at all, all possibilities. Uh, no, you know, when a human being, human life is precious and uh, we have to take uh, the chances what we can take or the reliability to which we have to refine this, in, uh, this whole operation has to be to a much greater order. So one talks about the making the launch vehicle more robust and reliable, but notwithstanding that as engineers we know, however reliable a system is, there is always the possibility of, probability of failures and contingencies. So one has to foresee these things and then have mechanisms to still save the life of astronaut. In fact, a crew escape system is an essential part of a launch from, of an astronaut from Earth to space. A, a, a development of a crew escape system, very robust system, and this is the most complex part of it because one has to envisage the various types of contingencies which can arise, how to detect them reliably, and how to uh, initiate the crew escape system, which has to be a more reliable even than the launch vehicle because the crew escape system, in that process, the astronaut should not get, his life should not get threatened. And the, this is going to be the most challenging part in my opinion. What we have is a, is a good launch vehicle and uh, definitely we have to see the, the processes and uh, processing of a launch vehicle which is uh, uh, proposed for a manned mission. The, the care which is taken is uh, uh, an order higher than an unmanned mission, naturally, in terms of production, in terms of processing. And other thing is implementing this uh, onboard or emergency detection system and a reliable crew escape system and validating this system and reliability. This, this is the first part of putting man into space, this is taking him from air to space. Other thing is the spacecraft itself which has become now a habitat. So, it has to sustain the life of astronaut in orbit, in, this, in the, the extreme environment of orbit. And there also we have to have several kinds of redundancies and fallback systems so that a single failure will not jeopardize the life. And also we have to plan there the several contingencies and how we have the maximum probability of recovering astronaut back to Earth safely in case such contingencies arise. So all these things are engineering challenges involving both hardware and software. So just, um, uh, please, go ahead. If, if I may, uh, I'd like to share a trivia uh, piece uh, with, from what you said about the crew escape system. Now, as part of my training, uh, we were required to have a look uh, at a launch, a live launch. And this was in December of uh, 83 as part of the syllabus, uh, there was a live link in Star City, and Star City is a training center just outside Moscow, while the launches take place from Kazakhstan in Baikonur. So there was a live uh, TV link, and we were watching the launch, and um, about three seconds before ignition, there was a fuel leak, 
and we could see it on this huge screen that the entire launcher was had exploded and uh, they of course immediately cut off the feed uh, the TV link uh, but at that point uh, the rage safety officer who was in charge of the launch did notice this on, on his monitor and he initiated uh, an escape uh, command uh, by which the escape system fired, the capsule was detached from the launcher, it moved out about a kilometer and a half uh, with uh, two uh, cosmonauts in it and uh, the parachute opened and both the crew members survived. So, uh, in fact, the engineer who was there, Gennady Strikalov, later flew as the engineer of my flight. So, we've seen this crew escape system uh, perform uh, live, and in fact, ISRO has recently completed that test successfully. So, that's one of the pieces which has already been tested. Actually, as rockets put it, in fact, as part of our technology development, this activity has been going on and you would have heard just a couple of, uh, maybe uh, six months back, we had a pad abort test, which is the first part of crew escape. In case of an incident, uh, which even before takeoff or near liftoff, if the malfunction occurs, the crew has to be removed from the uh, failing vehicle and taken away and safely landed. And you know, it, it has not happened several times, this is one particular uh, Russian launch it happened and we all have this video even in YouTube you can see that and it tells us the importance of this system if you want to take care of the astronauts and make sure that their life is not in jeopardy under any condition. No, clearly sir, thank you so much for that. I mean it's very easy to watch on a TV screen and you know watch the countdown, watch the rocket go up but the risks are very clear from what you talk about. Um, no, so you talked about working with the Soviet team, watching the TV screen live from Moscow. Uh, what is it like to have different cultures working together on such a launch? I mean, you were in Russia training with them, languages are different, aspirations are different. You know, space has become a multinational endeavor. What is it like working with other cultures? Uh, well, space has to become a multinational and they were going forward. I, at that time, it wasn't so. At that time, well, it was uh, the, uh, the uh, Cold War was still on. Glasnost hadn't yet happened. Perestroika hadn't happened. So it was a closed society. And really speaking, my flight, although it was scientific in content, had very specific geopolitical aims, which is why the flight was offered by the Soviet Union to convince the rest of the world that India is one of their satellites. And uh, therefore, when I was sent for the training, the training, the undercurrent was that I was only, uh, the knowledge they shared with me was just what was required for the safe conduct of the flight. It, it wasn't to satisfy my technical curiosity. So, so in, in that sense, it wasn't as fulfilling from a professional standpoint. So that's how it was at, at that time. So it's as much political as it is scientific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. So just building on that, um, Given we are going into more, you know, international collaboration on space, what are, Dr. Ramakrishnan, what are some of the cornerstones of, you know, India's success and where do you think India will make its mark or contribute in terms of international space development? No, as I said, basically now we have established ourselves uh, as a, a space-faring nation in terms of our ability to access space and send any spacecraft on different kinds of mission. And now getting uh, this human space flight capability, in my opinion, is the ultimate in the spacefaring uh, uh, arena, if you take. Once you have this capability, because as we said, uh, uh, the unmanned mission to manned mission, the complexities are much more. And uh, once we are able to master this technology, our, uh, our standing in the Committee of Nations is going to be better. Uh, uh, much, uh, uh, much, advan uh, much advanced than what it is today. Apart from that, the, the current trend is that anything further beyond, you know, we have had uh, 
the space station for more than 16, 15, 16 years, which is manned. And the complaint is that the, the exploration, which started with the Big Bang during the Apollo missions, then it uh, whittled down and then it has been only the near-Earth uh, uh, operations. And uh, now again there is a revival of uh, exploration. As you know, the Mars is uh, one of the very interesting and exciting uh, locations which uh, people would like to explore. And of course, all the other planets, robotic exploration has taken place. And the lunar base, there is a talk about establishing a lunar base. Because once uh, people are talking about manned mission to Mars, you would have even seen the advertisement, uh, the, inf uh, the announcements from NASA, several targets. They talked about 2015, 2020, 2030. The, you know, the, the, the issues involved in sending man to Mars are really very, very severe and serious. Even recently, NASA has listed six major uh, issues, what they, uh, obstacles, what they feel. Number one is, of course, the, the, the journey time itself. It's not less than 300 days one way. And uh, exposure of astronauts to such a long time to the cosmic radiation and its effect. Now, from space station, we have got enough inputs on what it does to the human physiology and how we are going to protect the astronauts from that. Number two is the, the confinement of uh, crew to a small uh, envelope in the, inside the craft and how they are going to psychologically uh, you know, put up with this kind of confined uh, living for such a long time. Other thing is, of course, in terms of the resources which you have to take and in terms of emergency, if it happens en route, how you are able to resolve. So many such factors are there. And having said that, even Mars itself, uh, before, if we are going to talk about putting man on Mars, as I said, in case of Moon also, ahead of this man mission, you must have robotic missions to go and establish certain habitats and other living quarters in the ground, and then only we can talk about the astronauts landing on Mars. So these are all the things in which uh, we feel will not, is not going to be resolved in the very near future. And now the thinking is coming around to establish see, space station. Yes, we have seen that man can live in space with the, all the uh, protections with the uh, space station environment, but then he, the supplies have to go from Earth. You know the space station is serviced by supply ships uh, every three, three months which take the supplies to space station, remove the waste, and this is happening. It's still tied to the Earth. Now what is felt is if at all you want to go progress in space exploration or manned exploration beyond this, and you have to make it self-sustaining. Of course, space station, they have tried the regenerative type of, uh, you know, res resource recycling. In fact, water on space station, ISS, I am told about 80 to 90 percent is recycled. The total water they are able to recycle. But then to do it, grow your own food, everything becomes self-sustaining. You know, it's going to be the major challenge. So, we have to use in situ resources to sustain human life. Now, the, the objective is to prove it in a near Earth environment of moon. So that is what is felt. Unless you do this and establish this, this possibility, there is no question of planning a trip to Mars. So this has been realized now, and there is a huge momentum towards establishing a habitat on moon. And in that context also, there is a realization that space activity, because of the high uh, resources involved, the high stakes involved, it can never happen through the effort of a single country. It is going to be an international effort. And in that context, our getting into this, uh, the, the capability to have our own, uh, sending astronauts on our, our own means is going to give us a good uh, leverage in becoming an equitable partner in such initiatives. Thank you, sir. Please. Just to uh, add a perspective to this is that, you know, Firstly, uh, it's difficult enough to attain a standard. So there's a technological challenge involved in making a complex thing happen, like uh, reaching the moon, etc. Now, with an advancement in technology, uh, there is an advancement also in the safety protocols, in how well can we now de-risk activities which are being done for the very first time. So, which is why we've had, say, successful 
dockings, we've had a successful shuttle landing, which were all done for the very first time. So the, the protocols which were followed was uh, uh, incremental. And so this brings along with it uh, an improvement in the safety of the, the, the conduct of the new uh, things which we are doing in space. Thank you. Just in terms of format, I also want to open up um, for questions in a few minutes. So if you have any burning questions or anything you would like to know, please think about it and we will pass the mic around in a few minutes. Um, because if you lock me in a room with these gentlemen for hours, I would be very happy to keep asking them questions, but I also want to open it up to the audience. Um, just as kind of a you know, final set of questions before we open it up, what are your thoughts on privatizing space flight? Uh, well, um, I, my thoughts are that if you're going to scale up the activities, the way it is being planned, from the standpoint of exploitation of, say, first near Earth orbit, because you're going to be earning revenue launching uh, satellites of uh, other countries. So scaling up the, the launch frequencies which are required uh, for that, you will really need to develop an ecosystem where the private sector helps you achieve those targets when it comes to frequency of launches. Now, the, the other aspect is that when private sector gets into it, uh, when you're talking, not exploitation, but if you're talking exploration, now what happens is that even there, they are looking uh, for profit because uh, Science with uh, an eye on profit is different to science uh, where you are trying to change the way we live uh, from, from the human race standpoint. What is more sustainable? How do you ensure that, that uh, you know, uh, we change the paradigm of violence which we are all trapped in. Now for that, it suggests that you will need to share the resources which you are going to find, otherwise most of your activities are going to be uh, exclusive in nature. And the private sector's uh, underlying philosophy is exclusivity because they are going to do whatever they have to do uh, to satisfy their investors. Whereas when it comes to exploration and like you said, uh, rich resources which are going to be available on the asteroids. So does this mean that only those countries which are scientifically advanced will be able to benefit from those resources? So in other words, the divide between technological haves and technological have-nots will continue to, to increase. So uh, the good side of public sector is that it will help you realize your aims for scaling up and I think the downside is, I think it will impede the inclusive, uh, inclusivity of uh, activities like this. Uh, adding on to what Rakesh said, the, you know, uh, privatizing space activity, maybe for our country we can discuss, but then private industries have been participating in space activity in other countries, as you know, in, uh, in USA, Delta, Atlas, they are all private uh, industries, of course, supported and funded by NASA. And um, today we have much more success stories. SpaceX, you would have heard about it, which is really has been doing revolutionary, uh, you know, uh, uh, changes in the access to space with their uh, reusable and recoverable boosters. So it's going to happen whether you like it or not, privatization is happening. And uh, access to space is going to become perhaps, uh, it is expected with the reusable uh, launch launchers, the cost of access to space will come down. And only with that expectation, the viability of harnessing resources from near Earth uh, asteroids has been picking up. And uh, there are several studies have been done on economic viability and profitability of the whole venture. And uh, you might be knowing that USA has passed a legislation that private companies can, though, yes, it controversies the UN declaration that space and space celestial objects are the property of humanity, uh, the whole humanity of Earth. But then, the, slowly, that, uh, the, there is a change happening. 
the allowing private industries to harness resources from moon or asteroids is possible today with the, uh, the uh, legislation in the US, at least the US companies are allowed to do that with the proviso that yes, they can do the, do the exploration and bring the material and make profit out of it. Of course, they can't claim uh, that the, the asteroid itself or the moon itself as their property. And so the, there is a internationally, it is now going through a big, uh, you know, uh, discussion on how to progress further in this law of, of uh, celestial bodies and moon treaty and such things. So privatization is, whether we like it or not, is going to happen. But as Rakesh put it, the one thing what, uh, the, uh, what has been accepted is that the Earth is unique and in fact people ability to go to space and view Earth has totally transformed our concept of life on Earth and the unique ecosystem and how fragile it is and also brought together that the, uh, cutting across the borders of countries and other things which are artificial, the whole uh, humanity is uh, as a single species and so any uh, benefits which comes from celestial bodies or space belongs to everyone on Earth and how it has to be equitably distributed. These are the issues which are in front of the, uh, the world fora like UN and a lot of debates and how to revise the legislation, how to control these activities is attracting attention in UN fora. Uh, just to add to his thoughts really is that um, if you look at Antarctica, and now that we are saying that, uh, that the private sector Will, is inevitable that they are going to get into this game. Uh, setting up a colony on moon is really beyond the capability of any one nation. So what really uh, is going to happen is that there is going to be collaboration. Now collaboration and already the government budgets are shrinking when it comes to space. Uh, money would rather go uh, to healthcare and social security. People will always ask, I mean, what's in it for us? Uh, so really speaking, when the private sector gets into it, what's really going to happen is because we have already touched upon the fact that the private sector is, has to satisfy its shareholders. What's going to happen is what's happened in Antarctica, that you draw lines saying that this much area is mine and whatever I mine from my area is mine. So it, it, in other words, you're going to be moving and you know what borders have done uh, to conflict on earth. Uh, you really will be moving, the, you're going to be creating newer battlefields except that they will be in space. Thank you. Um. <laughs> We have volunteers with mics on the sides. So please raise your hands for any questions. Um, uh, good morning. I'm Gokul. Uh, the question falls to uh, Rakesh Sharma, sir. Sir, uh, you have been in the space for uh, seven days and 12 hours. And uh, how do you feel when you reach the Earth? The first moment, what did you feel like? Because you have been flying in the space, and when you're, like, your foot has touched in the Earth, what did you feel? That is one. Second question is that, uh, you have done some 43 experimentation in the space. So, which is most curi like uh, curiosity experimentation, which till now you could not able to forget? Uh, well, um, yeah, I've been in space for around eight days. Uh, you wanted to know what my feelings were upon returning. I will tell you that uh, space uh, is is a good place to work. The view is great. Uh, but when you come back, but when you come back, there's nothing like living on Earth because, you know, at least on Earth you stay grounded, literally. Uh, if you're in, in orbit, you are flying around, and whatever you're working with is also flying around with you. So, if you're whatever takes half an hour to do on Earth takes about one and a half hours to do in space. So, so that that is one aspect. And the second part of the question was the, the yeah, the experiments. Uh, the Indian scientific community decided to use this opportunity 
to do some experiments. So our experiments were uh, clubbed under three heads. One was Earth Resources, and that was sponsored by SRO, where we utilized the Russian multispectral cameras to uh, photograph the Indian landmass uh, from the Earth Resources, and we gathered some intelligence out of that, which today has become really the database for our own IRS satellites. And uh, then there, was, there were experiments in biomedicine to study uh, the mechanical activity of the heart, psychological experiments were there. There were some experiments during uh, doing material science where we tried to grow a crystal of silver and germanium because zero gravity gives you a, a very unique environment that the uh, crystals, the structure is absolutely perfect because there is no gravity during the, the melt, you know, doesn't kind of uh, compress due to gravity, the, the lower path. So it's a, it's a perfect structure. So these were the three experiments. Of course, in the biomedical part, we, I did yoga uh, for the first time in space uh, to try and find out whether yoga gives you a, a better method to condition the human body to adjust to zero gravity environment. We had a question on this end as well. Please, sir. Uh, go ahead. What was your journey from India to Russia? That is, how from a fighter jet pilot to a cosmonaut in Russia? From a fighter pilot. <laughs> the big difference was uh, communication. The most difficult part of my training was to learn the Russian language. Uh, the entire training was in Russian, and I had to learn the Russian language. Entire communication with the uh, uh, mission control uh, was in Russian. So uh, language was one big difference. The other difference was uh, the weather itself. Uh, we experienced two winters, which is minus 30, 35 in, in Moscow. Uh, in fact, the Cuban astro cosmonaut was rumored to have told the Russians that you guys have two winters out here around the year. One is a green winter and one is a white winter. So uh, weather was the other one. And I think the third difficulty was uh, the state of that society at that time. The Iron Curtain was up and, uh, you know, everybody would talk. There was no human interaction at a personal level. Everything was only technical. Now, this is very alien to our culture because we are so open with each other, uh, you know, and uh, so that was the other reason, and I've touched upon that earlier, that your technical curiosity was never satisfied. So these were the differences. Whereas as a fighter pilot, well, you, you learn about the aeroplane in English, you communicate with, with the flying control in English, and uh, with your other buddies also in, in, in a language which both of you understand. So that was easy. And then home is home. The dal chawal is always there when you come back. <laughs> There's a gentleman there with a question. Sorry. Um, so it's, a, it's not just a pleasure, but an absolute honor to uh, see you guys. You're stuff of legend. Um, Question is, uh, we have so many uh, professions here on Earth where we have accepted that there's a real threat to life and limb. Like you have an armed force where people go to the battlefront and they know that they may end up in a box. You have sports like uh, boxing where people literally punch them and they know that they will uh, be serious uh, consequences. Sports like Formula One where they travel that 300 kilometers per hour knowing that very rarely they couldn't come out of the race alive. Now, we have accepted all these things as real life uh, threatening uh, professions or sports or activities. Why is there so much emphasis on an astronaut's life uh, and safety? You talked so much about escape pods and uh, you know um, how, uh, billions of dollars spent on ensuring the safety of astronauts. Why is it that there are so much emphasis on uh, an astronaut's life as compared to other activities? Well, I'm happy. See, um, you must understand for that uh, first thing is how we go to space from Earth. You know, space is something which everyone can see and it looks as though you can jump and go to space. But, you know, we don't realize it, the gravity of Earth is uh, so strong. To get out of Earth and go to space, the only means is the 
chemical rocket propulsion because you need large amount of force and the velo you know what is happening in a launch vehicle or when you try to put something into space or when you send, try to send astronaut in space he is taken from rest on ground to something like 8 kilometers per second in a matter of 15 to 20 minutes and the velocity gain has to be matched with the density decrease in the atmosphere and only a mass based rocket propulsion the chemical rockets can accomplish this and even today there is the only viable means of going to space. Having said that when you look at chemical rockets, what is happening there is very powerful oxidizer and fuel are in fact exploding in the combustion chamber. A rocket is a ex controlled explosion and uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are typically a, a big booster which is taking astronauts up is generating gigawatts of power during the boost phase and that power has to be controlled and the, when you take a launch vehicle, that's the most dynamic plant. It's, when you take a typical launch vehicle, it starts with a few hundred tons and ends with two tons, three tons, which is getting into orbit. Rapidly changing plant with, the, with rapidly changing characteristics and taking it through precisely with the full control is a real challenging job and several things can go wrong. And that is the challenge. And when we are putting a man on top of it, definitely one has to see how his, yes, they are informed volunteers as of now when we talk about astronauts who have been going right now and very soon we are going to look at uh, space tourism where people are going to space just for the, you know, for the enjoyment and uh, several companies are coming forward and definitely when we have such things and even otherwise, when we know the risks are so much and the failure probabilities are so much, one has to plan for uh, the kinds of mechanisms to make sure that the life is saved when such contingencies arise. But having said that, it is not going to be 100%. Finally, what is the acceptable risk? How much we can reduce it? So, the, as you said, any this is informed, even as you say, sportsman or a boxing person knows that he is exposed to certain risk and he takes protection. Does he not wear? Uh, the helmet and such things and protective gear. This is something similar to that when we are sending we, a person on top of such a complex high energy device, one should have mechanisms to save when something goes wrong. And that's why crew escape system becomes a very important part of astronaut uh, manned mission. Uh, just a small addition, uh, and it is to do with the cost of training. You know, when you are investing so much to train, let's take a, let's take a fighter pilot. A, he's operating a machine which is today, each machine is 500 crores, if you, if you or even more than that, as uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi is suggesting. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but to get into that machine, you've got to train hours and hours on other machines which are also expensive. So the amount of time and money that has been invested to make you a pilot uh, good enough so that you can fly that costly machine and bring it back uh, only means that, that you're, you are an asset and a, and a human asset. So, so you need to be protected. Uh, and, and, th and that's why uh, so much money. But it's a good question. Why do we spend so much when life in India otherwise is cheap? <laughs> yes. On that note, I will unfortunately have to close questions from the audience. Uh, these gentlemen will be here uh, for a few more hours and hopefully join us for lunch. Uh, so we can ask them further questions at that point. Um, so thank you very much for the questions from the audience and most importantly, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan and um, Commander Rakesh Sharma, thank you so much for joining us today. A big round of applause for our guests. I request uh, Mr. Sriram Viji to present with a token of appreciation to our speakers for the day. I request Mr. Sudarshan to please join us on stage to present a token of appreciation to our moderator, Mr. Sriram Vijay.